Uh, Comrades, friends, firstly, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think it's the third time, isn't it, I've been to Comrades University. I first came as a slightly precocious 15-year-old, but I look still like a precocious 15-year-old. <laughs> 12. It's alright, mate. Honestly, quite down. Right, so, um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, now, in terms of the book itself, I should just explain what the purpose of the book is, what the point of the exercise was. It was to, in however modest or limited way, contribute to uh, reopening a debate on class which had been intentionally closed down. Um, and without any understanding of class, there is no class politics. Without class politics, there is no left. Uh, something our enemies, if you like, are more than fully aware of. Now, um, in the late 70s, the Conservative Party had a statement of aims in 1976, and they said, the problem in Britain isn't the existence of classes, it's the existence of class feeling. And that was one of the things that Thatcherism aimed to extinguish um, in this country. Thatcher herself said, class is a communist concept. It bundles people together and sets them against each other. Uh, in, at the beginning of her crusade in the late 70s, uh, she said, we need to create a new mind, a new British mind. She wanted to recreate, change people's attitudes in, in a way, I think, which is almost unprecedented in modern history. I think the last time there was such an attempt, in a sense, to ambitious attempt to change people's psyche goes back almost to the Puritan Commonwealth in the 17th century. So Thatcherism wanted to drive class out of existence. And as I say, without class, there is no left. Now, in terms of what the book actually looks at, is this idea, the legacy of that, if you like, the idea, this myth that everybody's middle class and that all remains of the old working class is a problematic, feckless rump. So Simon Heffer put it to me, I don't know if people know Simon Heffer. Normally people heckle at that point. It's kind of like panto sometimes. Yes, we know Simon Heffer. That's better. Yeah. Yeah. Hiss at any point. <laughs> um, right, so Simon Heffer, he said what we used to call the, the respectable working class doesn't exist, um, barely exists anymore. What sociologists used to call the working class doesn't work at all and is dependent on the welfare state. Now, actually, he'd never used the word chow, incidentally. In fact, he made that clear. He abhors the, abhors the term. Both his children who are eaten, he says, use it all the time, and he's you know, up in arms about it. But that's the chow caricature. And not everyone puts it in quite those terms. The Tories and the right often have this idea everyone's middle class apart from the underclass. Um, and New Labour, I mean, Blair himself said, we're all middle class, um, and uh, apart from what they call the socially excluded. Now, when I interviewed Matthew Taylor, who was Blair's former head of strategy, um, he said uh, the thing about social exclusion is it's different from class, which he said was assigned to you almost. Uh, social exclusion meant you had the role in your own exclusion, that where you were in the pecking order was partly determined by your own behaviour. So all of those, in a sense, kind of draw on this idea, middle class majority, feckless, um, problematic rump of the old working class. Now, all of that partly was to make... Uh, left-wing politics impossible, as I say, because no, the, the base, as the right recognised and would always talk about, was the working class. And often you'll have a discussion amongst new Labour in terms of justifying the shift from any form of traditional left politics by the fact that the old working class, which was its backbone, um, had vanished. Now, in terms of the impact on people's attitudes, um, Thatcherism has had a profound impact on uh, people's attitudes. It's interesting, actually, often in polls, um, generally, actually, it's been fairly consistent the number of people describing themselves as working class. It's only between 50 and 55%. Uh, but there was a recent study by Britain Thinks, and um, that came up with quite a different finding. 71% said they were middle class, and just 24% said they were working class. And what was, I think, interesting and disturbing about this was uh, Deborah Mattinson, who ran the poll, said... Uh, the working class tag itself had become a class-based insult, um, much like uh, the word chav. And when people went away, uh, play word association with it, get newspaper clippings of kind of what working class meant to them, they came back with chav-based caricatures like uh, anti-social behaviour, spending money in a tacky way, um, binge drinking. But what was interesting is you'd get um, one focus group, uh, two focus groups, 
uh, with almost the exact same background, exact same jobs, but one said they were middle class and one said they were working class. But what they thought was that the, those who call themselves middle class were attempting to distance themselves from a demonised um, identity. It was something they didn't want anything to do with, effectively, because of the way it, it was regarded. So that's an example, I think, a disturbing example of how that has had an impact on class consciousness. Um, the assault, the, all that class war, if you like, of the 1980s. Now, in terms of what that did and the impact I think it's had, uh, you had this uh, all-out attack on industries, which sustained many working class communities, on trade unions. Uh, over half of all workers were trade unions in 79. Uh, it's now just over a quarter. Um, an attack on council housing, um, an attack on values like solidarity, and all of those had a huge impact in terms of, in terms of these were assaults on kind of pillars of, of, of working class, if you like. And with that, a sense of class consciousness, I suppose, uh, also came under attack. Now, in terms of what's happened, I think, to the working class, because this is what the left has to understand if it's to develop a new class politics, is the way it has, there has been a genuine shift. So, in 1979, over 7 million people worked in manufacturing, and today it's uh, just over 2.5 million. Now, um, what that means, and it's not to get Rose, again, to look back dewy-eyed at what existed before, but often more men, you know, worked, um, a lot of the jobs were dirty and back-breaking, but communities were often based around uh, a dock, mine, steelworks, a uh, factory of some description, um, those jobs were passed through generation to generation, people lived and worked together, uh, often those jobs existed for a, a long period, if not for an entire lifetime. And that, uh, there were high levels of unionisation, um, and that provided a, a more, a very natural, often organic sense of solidarity. Now what's happened now is we've seen the growth obviously of the service sector. So today, there are as many call centre workers, a million call centre workers, as there were miners at the peak of the mining industry. Supermarkets, retail, are the second biggest employer in the country. But what's different about them is, firstly, you don't necessarily have communities built around supermarkets and call centres in any way near the same way. Uh, you've had this casualisation, um, there's a much higher level of part-time work, the number of workers in part-time work now who want to be in full-time work is at a record high, it's about 1.3 million. There are another 1.5 million temporary workers. Uh, now this is particularly true often in um, the service sector. Levels of unionisation, if we look at unionisation, I mean we've had unions almost driven into a public sector stronghold. Over 50% of public sector workers are unionised. In the private sector it's 14%, it's just gone down a percentage point over the last year. But what's interesting also about that is the majority of those used to be in the public sector and have been contracted out or privatised. Um, in fact, that makes 11 out of the 14%. In the service sector, levels of unionisation are extremely low. Um, so although the number of people working in supermarkets has trebled since 1980, uh, the number of people unionised has stayed re relatively flat, about 8, 8 to 10% of supermarket workers are in any form of union. So what you've had there is um, it's more fragmented, um, you have people um, often going from job to job. Um, often there's less of a sense, it's interesting, I interview call centre workers in supermarkets, there's less of, less of a sense of pride in what they were doing in a sense. Um, now, at the same time, for example, call centres often compared to factory conditions in the late Victorian period. You've got large numbers of people working often in quite large workplaces um, in you know, and so you've kind of, you do have that create recreations of, this, of, of, of almost the traditional proletariat, if you like, even though, uh, again, there's often, I mean, there's a huge turnover of call centre workers. It's interesting there, again, is the, the pressure of management to stop any form of communication. So call centre workers often will be in rows, they're forbidden often from talking to each other at all, they have to stick to a script, often have to put their hands up to go to the toilet, again, which is very reminiscent of the Victorian working conditions. Um, and as yet, PCS, for example, are an example of a union which are desperately trying to unionise those call centre workers, but again with very limited success as of yet. So this new service sector working class has very low levels of unionisation, it's more fragmented, um, there's um, 
much more casualised than the old industrial working class. Um, now, the working class obviously has never been homogenous. It's always had, you've always had skilled workers, unskilled workers, those who might have lived in the, in the pre-war and interwar period in slums, those lived in early forms of social housing, homeowners, uh, the London working class, the Scottish working class. Um, but the fractures, the divisions within the working class clearly expanded under Thatcherism. And, and that was, again, one of, one of the aims of what she did. Um, the ex-industrial communities were particularly badly hit, and the levels of economic inactivity in those areas remained still very high, and remained so even during the boom period. Um, you, uh, the attack on council housing was, again, part of that, um, that project. Um, in 1979, if we look at even at the top 10% of the population, a fifth of those people lived in social housing. Um, now, with the right to buy and the failure to invest in new stock, council housing became uh, prioritised for those most in need. And it's treated, and, and this is now going to accelerate under this government, which is a tax light and tenancy, it's treated as a social dumping ground, effectively. That's, their, that's, that's, that's how they regard it, almost. Um, not as something which is in any way to be supported. And what that's meant, I mean, the child caricature, for example, is often used particularly against people who live in council housing. Council housed and violent, council housed associated vermin, council housed and vulgar, uh, and examples of acronyms people have invented. So that's a division you've had which is expanded. You've had um, um, this concentration, intentional concentration of, of people in council housing, again, for political purposes. Now, all the div because of um, the fact you've had this attack on, on um, um, the disappearance of secure work in entire communities, because the work that replaced those that disappeared was often the jobs were, were smaller in number and more insecure, uh, what, you've, what you've had is this um, demonisation, obviously, of people who are unemployed, so-called benefit cheats. But again, what's clever about what they do there is this isn't just middle-class people who think our taxes are being spent to subsidise the feckless. The way the right politicians and tabloid journalists um, aim that is, is at people often low-paid work who are struggling to make ends meet, and this idea that someone down the road who is living some supposed life of luxury whilst you're toiling away, and that causes more resentment amongst that group than anyone else. And that, again, is an intentional attempt to widen and, and exploit those divisions. And, of course, the counter-argument on the left will always make clear, I mean, benefit for this country is £1.2 billion a year. It's often very complex. It's people in huge amounts of debt doing a bit of cash in hand compared to £70 billion pounds of tax evasion by those who are wealthy. Um, there's certainly not enough jobs to go around in this country. There's two and a half million people unemployed, another million on incapacity benefit the government's trying to force into em employment, um, and there's less than 500,000 vacancies. But again, that is an, an example of how this fissure has been widened by Thatcherism and what Thatcherism did. Um, what you've ha what's another, I suppose, obstacle the left has is the way the working class was racialised. Um, now New Labour, as I say, first denied the existence of class altogether, but when class re-emerged at all, it was this idea of the white working class. Um, and that was when the BNP started breathing down their necks in places like Dagenham. And the idea of that was that the problems of the white working class weren't put down to their class, but as much as down to their colour. It was a, a kind of perverse, because class had been taken out of the debate and we still accepted inequalities, the political establishment accepted inequalities, still existed in racial division. It was this idea that this was a kind of a, almost a marginalised ethnic minority in its own right. It was one disorientated by the onward march of multiculturalism, obsessed with immigration, bigoted and so on, but one which had somehow, was, was, its problems were to be understood in a racial, through a racial prism. Um, and that was another kind of way that you've got this offensive, I guess, against class identity in this country. Now, what I wanted in terms of to talk about, um, I suppose, today is how the left, and this is what I wanted to debate about, is how the left actually approaches this, uh, approaches this huge onslaught against uh, working class consciousness. Now, I think there's a number of things to discuss in terms of the way the Labour movement responds to it. Um, 
at the turn of the 20th century, as people know, the, um, when unions were particularly um, concentrated among skilled craft workers and so on, the new unionism was about recruiting unskilled workers. Now, there needs to be an entirely new model of trade unionism in this country, which is based on, um, on, on organising the service sector in particular. Because that is the basis then of, I mean, unless we organise, it's difficult to build a much broader movement on the left. Um, it needs to be one which is equally based in the community as well as, as, as the workplace. Um, in terms of, I mean, in the past few years we've seen, uh, even before the boom, stagnating wages. Um, from 2003 onwards, real income fell in every single English region outside of London. After 2004, the bottom half wages stagnated and the bottom third, they actually went into real terms decline. Now that's to do with a range of things from trade unionism, uh, the, the assault, assault on trade unions and how weak they are, to the effects of capitalist globalisation with the race to the bottom. Um, now unless again we have, we look and debate about how we build an international labour movement to actually relate to that, to organise on that basis, then Again, there's no way of actually responding to that, but the difficulties involved are obviously huge. So what I wanted to debate, and as I say, the whole point of the book is just a prompt almost, is to raise those issues um, and actually get a debate going about how the left responds um, to this all-out offensive we've seen in the last 30 years. Because unless we can actually construct a new class politics for the 21st century, taking into account these factors, then the left obviously has no future in this country. So I wanted to open it up on that basis and actually discuss it, if that's okay. Brilliant, thank you very much. People are more likely to be victims of crime and antisocial behaviour, and those are issues the left often are very diff find very difficult to even talk about. Uh, those are things which people often find very oppressive. They find, you know, there's a sense often of, of feeling threatened in your, in your own community. And the left often leaves that to the right to talk about. I have a problem with the whole concept of the lumpy proletariat. I know Mark talked about it. I think it's right to talk about criminal elements, and I think that's what he was talking about. I mean, he, one example he gives is brothel owners. I mean, those aren't the people we're talking about in this situation. Obviously, they're criminal, criminal elements, and they exist. Um, the, the underclass theory often, in particular, it, it, it's normally connected to the welfare state, so there's no comparison to be made with what Marx was talking about, because it's this idea of a feckless underclass who is subsidised by the welfare state. That's what people are normally talking about. So it's not, I don't think the lump and proletariat thesis, problematic as I think it is, is actually applicable uh, to, that, to that situation because there was no welfare state when Marx was actually writing. Um, I mean, what we need to talk about, in terms of antisocial behaviour and crime, I mean, I went to Ashington, which used to be the biggest pit village in, in the world until the, 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 the mines closed in 1986. And people spoke very honestly about problems of antisocial behaviour and, and the problem, and, and often, you know, again, people found it, you know, it's difficult to live through often, it makes people's lives a misery. But people understood what the roots were. It was that lots of young working class people, generally men, let's be honest, who once would have had a job, they could leave school at 16, get a skilled apprenticeship, which was relatively decently paid, which then had a possible future, to aspire to, uh, which was well respected, and uh, that disappeared, well, virtually overnight, in the case of someone like Ashington, and you were left with lots of young working class people who no longer felt there was any future to even risk. And I think when we talk about antisocial behaviour and how it affects particularly, particularly often uh, poorer communities and some of the ex-industrial communities, that's often the basis of it, and that's what socialists should understand. But again, without justifying it, without because this is something which, again, working class people in particularly, particularly are, vi are victims of. Uh, I mean, I agree in that sense. I mean, the problem with kind of like the child character, what I'm combating, I suppose, is the idea everyone's middle class apart from this problematic rump of the old working class. In theory, you could still then say, well, the lumber proletariat, all chaps still exist, they're just not the same as the working class, fine. I mean, I'll give you an example, Vicky Pollard, is, she's probably the kind of epitome, isn't she, of the chap yeah. in people's minds. And, you know, when people laugh at that, they're laughing at a privately educated millionaire co male comedian dressing up as this grotesque caricature of a teenage mum from a white working class background who's so thick she swaps one of her children for a Westlife CD. And um, there was a poll done of people working TV 
four years ago, um, over 70% said that she was an accurate representation of the white working class. And I think that just shows the kind of how distorted people's attitudes have become in, in that sense. So in terms of, um, I mean, what we saw, again, we'll come on to the rise, I think. People are going to talk about the rise, I think, at some other point. But in terms of, I do think there, is, there are those sections of the working class which were particularly badly hit by what happened in the 80s and which never recovered because of the failure of New Labour to address those issues in any meaningful way. And obviously that provides fertile ground for, well, anti-social behaviour and crime. Um, but I don't think, you know, we then say about young people in Ashington that they've become lump and proletarian simply because their future have been snatched away from them by the all-out class war of the 1980s. I know that's not what you're saying, but we've got to guard against that. Just to come back, I'll come back to you then, I think. Um, yeah, I think, um, <coughs> well, in terms of the impact of the anti-union uh, laws, they were, I mean, Tony Blair himself boasted we've got the most restrictive anti-union laws in the Western world, despite Labour's changes, which were obviously very minor. Uh, but what really broke the back of the Labour movement in the 1980s was mass unemployment. Um, in fact, Sir Alan Budd, you know, Alan Budd, he was, he was appointed by the Tories to be, was it the Centre for Budget, what's it, Responsibility or something? Office, Office of Budget Responsibility. Anyway, he advised Thatcher in the uh, 1980s. He was, uh, and then became Treasury, the Treasury Chief Economist. And he said he suspected the government never believed in a moment that this was the correct way to bring down inflation. They did, however, see that it would be a very, very good way to raise unemployment, and unemployment was an extremely desirable way of reducing the strength of the working classes. Now, if you've got four minutes, I mean, people, there's often this view, sometimes on the left, that mass unemployment is fertile ground for Labour militancy when it's not. I mean, it's a way of disciplining working, the working class. If you've got four million, employed, uh, four million unemployed people, you've got at least another four million, unemployed, uh, four million people in jobs who are terrified of losing them. And often the last thing you do in that situation is resort to Labour um, to, to, to strike action. And unemployment, even during the boom period, remains very high often in the areas which were most devastated. And that was a way of undermining the bargaining position of, of Labour. And there's absolutely no uh, disputing that. I mean, the anti-union laws are a problem, you're right. But, uh, I mean, if you talk about Viking and Laval, that's interesting. Because that, for example, allows um, employers to hire workers at the same minimum wage as the country they come from. I think that's Viking, isn't it? You can employ yeah. someone from, from, on, from well, Greece with the same minimum wage that's in Greece in Britain. It's illegal. What, what Viking and Laval say is that it's illegal to take strike action. Oh, that's uh, Viking. Unless the, um, and similarly, it's illegal to have local regulatory legislation which requires the employer to pay anything more than the yeah. minimum wage in, in the, the country, in host country. In, in the Viking says in the host country, Laval says in the country of origin. Yeah, country of origin, yeah. So it's interesting because in the refinery strikes, which people obviously remember, and um, I'm sure people remember, and that was portrayed as just a racist strike. But for example, um, what's the refinery called? Well, Keith Gibson from the Socialist Party was. Lindsay. Uh, li yeah, Lindsay. Lindsay Oil refinery. And you know, the demands they included were to hire workers, um, foreign workers, on the same terms and conditions as existing workers, which is obviously. You know, was commendable, and that that's a that's a progressive unionised response uh, in terms of the way foreign labour can be used. Obviously, the first international was founded in large part to stop foreign labour being used as scab labour in a, in, a, in a host country, and and immigration in that sense can be manipulated by employers. Um, um, and the way the response to that isn't obviously to kick out foreign workers; it's to it's to have make sure they're employed in the same terms and conditions, to unionise them, and having li have a living wage so you can't actually undermine. Uh, people's wages and conditions using foreign workers. But anyway, um, in terms of, um, just quickly, because I know we're going through this, in terms of Ed Miliband being the representative of Blairism, well, look, Blairism, I mean, sometimes I think the left comes into this big man view of history when it looks at Blairism. It's kind of, you know, I mean, the, the traditional Stalinist view of what happened to the Soviet Union was Khrushchev took over in the early 50s, uh, the revisionists took over and then it stopped being socialist and it overthrew the workers' state. And often there's a left similar response to the Labour Party in that they'll go, basically, Blair took over with his right-wingers and they were right-wing, so they made the Labour Party more right-wing. When actually Blairism was the product of a severe, well, a perfect storm, 
the repeated defeats of the 1980s, which crippled the labour movement, um, as well as the rise of the new right, the ideological consequences of the collapse of Stalinism, which seemed to discredit in any alternative to capitalism whatsoever. And if it hadn't been Blair, it would have been someone else. And the continued strength at the top of the Labour Party of Blairism has everything to do with the consequences of those defeats, which were never overturned, and frankly, a lack of pressure coming from below to reverse that, which there is still a lack of pressure coming from below. And I think if there was stronger pressure from below, um, that would force the trade union bureaucracy, if you like, to put pressure on the Labour leadership uh, to drag them into a position which was obviously away from Blairism, and that hasn't happened. So I don't think there's this top-down view of Blairism, which the left just has to get over, because it is so much the product of all those defeats, which we just haven't obviously begun to um, overturn in any way. In terms of just talking, finally, just in terms of, obviously we need a vision. I mean, I talk at the end of the book, what I tried to say, I and mean, obviously I didn't really talk about it in great detail, was um, uh, the new class politics would be a start, at least, to build a counterweight to the hegemonic, unchallenged class politics of wealthy. I'm quoting myself, that's a late point. Perhaps then a new society based around people's needs, rather than private profit, would be feasible once again. And the point I'm making is sometimes the left doesn't start where people are. Um, and obviously the level of political consciousness is very, very, very low in this country indeed, as a result of all the defeats, I guess, we're discussing. So, of course, we need that vision, but it has to relate to, relate to people's experiences, and often the left fails at that, in my view. Just come to Ellie quickly. Um, well, I agree in terms of the number proletariat, I think we're in total agreement on that. Um, yeah, and we need, again, you're right, we need militant shop stewards. I think that's what kind of you're arguing for. But there needs to be, I mean, the role that, I mean, the, the problem we have, I mean, that is important, but is again building that pressure from below. I mean, the problem is it won't take a few militant shop stewards to turn that around. I mean, that's the basis of building a strong movement, I guess. But the problem we have at the moment is the level of political, I mean, the, the level of political Education in the wider, even in the wider, in, among unionised workers, is obviously very low remain, and remains as such. But I guess that's what I mean. That's what you're talking about, I suppose. I mean, in terms of that, would be one of their key roles to politicise and radicalise. Um, and I totally agree because, and the problem is, in terms of the unions, in terms of how they've been so battered, um, is well, which is what you're basically talking about. Often they're treated shop stewards as basically unpaid health and safety officers, and that's often the role they're relegated to. Uh, and obviously, that has to be that kind of has to be fought against, that kind of very limited role um, people have. But yeah, I think that's... Thank you. Okay, uh, well firstly, Thatcherism, yeah, of course Thatcherism was a product of, I mean, we should talk about Thatcherism, not Thatcher, again. Um, there's this idea, Thatcher single-handedly transformed Britain is obviously ridiculous, and I, in, in, a, in a group of Marxists that would probably be fairly obvious. Uh, obviously what happened in the, in the 70s is the sh pro there was a huge squeeze on profits and the proportion of the economy going to profits was declining year on year and the amount going to wages was increasing and Thatcherism reversed that, not, not least by um, imposing discipline again on the working class, not least through mass unemployment. So now the share going to wages, which I think in the mid 70s was about, in the, it was in the late 60, it was about 66%, 67%. It's now down to about 53%, which is the lowest in the post-war period. And that's obviously one of the, one of the legacies of, of what Thatcherism did intentionally as a project, and it was to, to restore that discipline and, and, to, and to reverse that squeeze on profit. Um, yeah, in terms, of, um, in, terms of the, in terms of restoring the industrial working class, well, there's no return to what existed in the, 50, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. That, the smokestack kind of factory kind of, you know, that, that is gone. And, I mean, I talk, and one thing we should be talking about, particularly in those communities which were particularly devastated in the 1980s, I mean, there are forms of industry, I mean, what happened in terms of Germany, is Germany had an industrial strategy, so they caught the high-tech boom, then they caught the renewable energies boom, and that meant, I mean, that was alien to new labour because they thought that was picking winners and losers, which was anathema to market economics. So obviously we should be making the, the point about, um, and, well, I mean, a basic social democratic demand is an industrial strategy uh, focused on those areas worst hit, and that'll be talking about green collar jobs and so on. And that those are forms of industrial jobs which you can recreate, uh, which aren't the same as existed before. Uh, but the point we have to make is, is changing the model we have to adapt. It's not about, I mean, there's never going to be a return to that old form of industrial working class. So the model of unionism and the left has to adapt to a service sector working class. 
anything else is just pie in the sky nonsense. We've got to accept where we are and what the working class is, not and kind of talking about some attempt to turn it back. I haven't read those articles in the Weekly Worker, so I can't really comment on them. But but that has to be the basis of what the Labour movement and the left does. Um, um, I mean, in terms of it's interesting you talk about the consumerism thing. I think is interesting in terms of the riots. Um, we live in a consumer consumerism. The, cons the way consumerism is, you know, the idea is your status in society has so much to do with what you wear on your own. That's what consumer capitalism has promoted. And young people, all young people, are supposed to buy into this idea of a consumer culture. And poor kids want to be as part of that as other kids. And in a place like Hackney, for example, which is one of the poorest boys in the country and yet has po pockets of huge affluence, you get people who see lives they will never they believe have, and it's almost being taunted with consumerism they have no access to. And I think that was one of the reasons, one of the explanations you could see for what actually happened uh, last week. Um, Barry, I, I don't know about the lawyer thing, to be honest with you. I, I, that was an interesting point. I just, I'm not sure what to say. But in terms of social sciences losing the radical edge, well, again, I think that's a manifestation of what's happened. Uh, Marxist um, historiography, historical theories were very, you know, think of you know, the British Marxist group, and I'm sure there's many criticisms in this room of the British Marxist group, from Thompson to Hobsbawm. But the reason they were prominent at that time is the labour movement was very strong, and socialism was seen still as a viable political uh, vision, if you like. And with the collapse, the attack on the labour movement, and um, particular after you know the ideological effects, the collapse of Stalinism, the rise of the new right, and so on, you got the rise of postmodern theories in social sciences. And I don't think that was anything to do specific to social sciences. It was just a reflection of what was going on elsewhere. There's a reason there's a decline of Marxism in history, and that's and, and so other social sciences is because there's been, well, I mean Marxism generally has come under huge attack. And um, I mean, that's just a symptom rather than anything else, I think. Um, Bobby, you know, I thought it was interesting again about the Netherlands. Another, in terms of the United States, what's interesting in the United States is this promotion of the idea that everyone's middle class, even if you're a millionaire or even if you're actually quite poor. Um, and obviously, it's interesting, though, what's happened if we look at what happened in Wisconsin a few months ago. And the American labour movement's on its knees even more than the British labour movement is. Only 9% of workers are unionised in America. And yet you've still got this actually very popular broad-based movement. But it's interesting, again, how it articulated itself, because people were talking about the war on the middle classes. And it, meant, it means something different than it does here. And it's inter I don't have an answer to that. I mean... I mean, you know, people talk about working people and there's, I mean, instead of talking about the working class, and again, there's all sorts of problems with that. Um, but that's worth discussing anyway. But uh, Pat, yeah, you're right. OK, there were more industrial workers than ever before. 19th century, when, Karl, when Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto, the biggest group of workers in the country were personal servants, um, as you allude to. And I wasn't trying to... Maybe it sounds like I'm being defeatist. Um, the point I'm making is that we have to adapt... I'm not saying it's impossible, it's not, not as though because of the collapse of industry and the industrial working class as it existed, uh, which began to decline from the late 50s onwards anyway, I mean it was accelerated dramatically after 1979, but that was already something that was in motion um, and has been across the whole <coughs> Western world. My point is that we just have to adapt to that. I'm not saying it's, as you say, in the, in the 19th century it proved to be possible. You got, you know, the Chartists in that period, before you got the, the large industrial working class, particularly in the first half of the 20th century. Of course it's possible, but we have to just find a way of adapting to it. And the left and the labour movement haven't even begun to do that, in my view. Um, and I agree in terms of d not talking about be impossible, demand, no, sorry, be, what is it, be realistic, demand the impossible. The point about socialism is we're saying capitalism is irrational and we are, we are providing a rational alternative to it. And that is what we have to say. Uh, otherwise it makes us sound like, well, I mean, it's a kind of, you know, for a student radical, fine. But in terms of actually trying to appeal to working people, uh, then we have to actually talk in, in, in the rational way you're talking about, rational solutions to the huge problems caused by capitalism. Um, yeah, back to Emily, back to the lumpen proletariat. I mean, I don't like that idea, for example, the culture of unemployment. I, I think 
in, in this country, there's, there's huge structural unemployment, particularly in the ex-industrial areas, and that's because often very secure industrial jobs disappeared in a very short period of time, and nothing really filled that vacuum. And I think, I mean, the, the position of the right when they talk about the underclass, which is, you know, I suppose one way of looking at the idea of a lump and proletariat, is firstly they're subsidised by the welfare state and their lifestyles, their feckless lifestyles are being propped up by a welfare state that encourages laziness. And after the uh, riots, one of uh, Cameron's responses was to say to, we need to end the welfare state that, fun, that, fuel, that, that um, subsidises laziness and idleness. So idleness, not laziness. Um, and I think there are sections of the working class which were battered by the events of the 1980s. And I don't think it's, I mean, I, I do have a problem with the whole notion of the Olympian proletariat. There are criminal elements, and I think that's what we should, talk, to, we should talk about. But I think the notion, I think the problem is we end up then demonising people for the consequences of capitalism. I mean, mass unemployment is a consequence of, and, 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 and one of the great, I mean, obviously what we're experiencing now. And if we start talking about the idea of people being culturally kind of, you know, unemployment being a response, you know, the a manifestation of people's culture, if you like, of, of their own behaviour. I think that's problematic. Um, and there are, there's a section of the working class which lives a very a far more precarious existence than other sections of the working class. So, for example, there's this idea, this benefit-addicted underclass. And after 1998, so before the crash, if, you, if, I, if you're a man and you signed up on Job Seeker's Allowance, 50% of those last signed up less than six months ago. And what that showed was a huge group of people going through benefits and low paid work, which was insecure. And I think that kind of goes against this idea. There's this huge static group of people who are living their lives on benefits. It's not, it's not actually true. There are lots of people, particularly in an old, as I say, the industrial communities, where you do have people, a high, far higher number of people on, 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 on benefits. And that's to do with the disappearance of employment. And I think that's the problem with it. And I think... The lump and proletariat is so ill-defined when people talk about it that it can be used, frankly, to demonise people who have, uh, you know, for problems which aren't the, the aren't the consequence of personal behaviour, but the consequence of the capitalism. Is it John who started? It was John? Yeah. Who, yeah. No, right. Oh, yeah. The Marxism today thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting Marxism today. Um, in the 80s, because obviously they actually provided a lot of the ideological foundations of, of new labour. And it started in sense of defeatism and brought on, you know, what Eric Cobbsman talks about before in March of Labour halted, which I suppose they felt was vindicated. In some ways it was vindicated, but it didn't have to be vindicated. Um, it happened because um, obviously the Labour movement and the work, well, the working class movement was, was defeated by Thatcherism in the 1980s. I, don't, I mean, there's no way of getting around that. And obviously Thatcher and Thatcherism prosecuted the class war in a ruthless way. Look, it's interesting actually, Neil Kinnock, I interviewed Neil Kinnock, that was fun. I told my parents though, they weren't particularly happy about it anyway. Got grounded for that. Um, right, he said, I asked him if he thought the Conservatives were the class warriors of British politics and he, he shook his head gravely. Uh, no, because they've never had to engage in a class war, largely because we signed the peace treaty without realising that they hadn't. I think quite a remarkable confession, but that's obviously true. Um, Labour didn't fight the class war in the way that the Tories did, and the Tories always fought the class war, and they had to adapt the way they fought it, um, because in the 19th century it was much easier to do when you've got a very limited franchise and working class people largely couldn't vote, and they adapted it very cleverly um, in the sense that they had to win a minority of the working class, which they always did. It was always overblown in the 1980s, incidentally. More, a higher proportion of working class people voted Tory in the 50s than they did in the 80s, but the anti-Tory vote was split, obviously, by the SDP split and so on. Um, but in terms of... Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've got to regard Thatcherism and, and, and the, the Tories... I mean, my chapter on the Tories is called Class Warriors, and obviously that, that's always should be our starting point in terms of analysing the Tories. Um, consumer culture... Yeah, um, I mean, as I say, it looked in Hackney, you could see that. It was young people who feel that consumerism is one of the main aspirations they have, effectively. Um, and they felt denied of it, and they felt they saw people who have access on a daily basis to that consumer culture. And the riots were one manifestation of that resentment, I think. Um, in terms of looking at the far right in the lumpen proletariat, I think that's interesting. I don't think the basis of the far right is the lumpen proletariat. I don't think it's the petty bourgeoisie either. I think 
the far right today, we have to understand, is very different from the fascism of the 1930s. In part, the fascism of the 1930s was a response to um, the existence of well, a revolutionary movement, the existence of a left. Um, and of obviously those sections of the petty bourgeoisie who felt threatened and they would be forced into the ranks of the working class by economic crisis. I think the far right today is a response to the weakness of the left. They filled a vacuum in certain communities uh, which has been left by the left and they offer reactionary solutions to everyday social problems. So in Dagenham, for example, a working class community where the BNP thrived, it wasn't amongst the petty bourgeoisie or any idea of the lumpen proletariat, it was amongst a section of the working class. Because what they said is, look, there's not enough housing to go round, there's not enough jobs to go round, so why are we giving it to them? That seemed like common sense. And that's because the death of social democracy, which would have provided answers to our housing crisis, answers in terms of jobs, by attempting to address certain social problems Within a, within a capitalist framework, but to address the kind of flaws within capitalism, that narrative disappeared, and the narrative the far right offered filled the vacuum. So I think it's nothing to do with the lump and proletariat or whatever. I think it's to do with the disappearance of the left in particular, and the fact that the far right have filled a, a vacuum in certain working class communities. Um, in terms of organising in communities, um, yeah, I think that's. I mean, you spoke about that. I think that has to be something the left has to do, not least because of the changing nature of work in that people are much more likely to jump from job to job. The turnover of staff in call centres and supermarkets is very, very high. You often get, and because of temporary workers and the growth of the temporary worker, people can jump from job to job within a few months. They can work for two months in one place and then work the next few months somewhere else. And so you can't just, because that's grown um, as a phenomenon in the workplace, the left has to respond by not just organising the workplace, which is still important, because it's the point of conflict with an employer, but actually in communities, and well, Ben talked about that in terms of how the SDP and, 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 the, and the German Labour movement did that, and that was a, a very good example, I thought. Um, well, in fact, coming on to Ben, I suppose, the, the vision thing. You sound like Tony Blair. What's wrong with <laughs> the vision thing, honestly? Um, well, look, in terms of left of labour challenges, I would love to imagine that the reason all these various sectarian projects failed is because they weren't being revolutionary enough. And actually, they weren't because they were being uninspiring and too, social, too much social democracy. I mean, the reality is every left of labour challenge has failed since the foundation of the Labour Party um, to establish itself as a mass force. Um, except, you could argue, the Communist Party had some successes at various points, but in a very limited way, especially if you compare it to most Western European countries. Um, I mean, obviously, the National Minority Movement, or what, we could go on. A couple of Communist MPs were elected after uh, the Second World War, but as far as I know, more Communists were actually elected as Labour MPs altogether than uh, as as direct communist in the, in the 1920s. But anyway, um, and, um, you know, we had the Social Democratic Federation at the beginning of the 20th century. We had the Independent Labour Party. My great uncle was on the, the, fo the national football team of the ILP in the 30s. It was obviously a very, pr as a very proud part of my family, but the ILP quit the Labour Party and dwindled into irrelevance. Uh, you had, um, obviously, milit my dad was a, full a militant full-timer um, for 10 years uh, in Sheffield. Largely had to quit because of the arrival of me and my twin sister. Sorry about that. But the militant <coughs> left the Labour Party and again dwindled into a, f a fairly frustrating sectarian project, in my view. Um, and then, I mean, Socialist Labour Party, was, I mean, there's no point even talking about it. And all these other sectarian projects failed as well. And they had no basis in the trade union movement properly. They had no, um, no basis within working class communities. And as long as the trade unions remain that basis of the Labour Party in however deformed and bureaucratic a way, I don't see any opening for left of Labour challenge. And it's difficult to argue why, in better political circumstances, when the, when the left was in better, far better shape than it is today, why will that succeed now when it has failed at every single opportunity in the last century? Um, and I think that is a question which has yet gone unanswered. In terms of the position of Ed Miliband, what prospects do I see? Well, look, let's be honest. The Blairites within the party remain dominant, and there's no organised... Le and I speak as a member of the LRC, uh, there's no uh, organised uh, left countervailing pressure to the Blairites within the Labour Party. Even if people, uh, you know, even if, even if Ed Miliband wanted 
uh, to shift position, he doesn't re even have any room for manoeuvre to do so. Now, the reason I thought it was important, not that Ed Miliband won, but that David Miliband lost, was that David Miliband leadership would be an ideological block in the sense that however much pressure you got from below, him and the people around him would have resisted it, and they would have resisted it tooth and nail. I think Ed Miliband is no socialist, but having, I think, is more susceptible from pressure from below. And I think if there was a strong left pressure from below, then I think the leadership could be forced against its will into positions that it wouldn't otherwise take. Will that happen? Well, it depends on partly the left getting its act together, but that depends on, on, on building, at least, or tapping into pressure from below. And you say, OK, the point isn't to go on about what the working class is, it's the point is to organise it. I agree, and that's, but we can, my point is we have to understand what the working class is and how it's changed in composition in order to do that. We have to, that has to be our starting point, because unless we actually, I mean, obviously my argument is Britain remains, there's a working class majority in Britain, I've never argued against that. My argument is changing shape and, and nature, uh, whilst remaining exactly the Marxist definition of the working class, and that we have to change how we organise on that basis. And, well, Mark said before, you know, it's always changed. Yes, of course it has. And the way, as a result, we organise has to constantly change too. And I don't think it has. And I think the trade union... I mean, the, st the statistics speak for themselves. The public sector, the trade unions, remain relatively strong within the public sector, but elsewhere they remain almost non-existent. Um, Alan... Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, you talk about, yeah, unemployment is deliberate. Well, this contentional strategy to destroy the key strong unions. The National Union Miners, obviously, that, I mean, it's always had beef with, the, I mean, the, the, the miners were the forward advance guard of the British working class movement from the, gen, the general strike, then obviously what happened in the early 1970s. And it's interesting, actually, because I interviewed Geoffrey Howe, gets even worse in my interviews, but uh, I interviewed Geoffrey Howe, who's obviously Thatcher's number two, and he put it to me, he said, what's often not remarked on is that Thatcher's government was really just Edward Heath's government reconstituted. It was, it was then returned to power with Thatcher at head instead of Ted Heath. And they, they, were humi that, they were humiliated by what the miners did, because the miners showed you could take on a Tory government and you could win. And that had the potential to, well, in terms of the confidence that gave other working class people uh, was potentially disastrous from their point of view. So they wanted to make an example, and they made an example, and the, and the cost of that was, of course, to destroy entire communities. And if you go to an old mining community, they remain devastated by what happened, and they never recovered. Uh, I mean, these are proud people, and obviously people got on with their lives as best they can, whatever's thrown at them. But, but, but of course, I mean, this, this, this was a class war, and people, and, you know, I interviewed ex-miners, they spoke about it in those terms. Um, you know, it's interesting. My dad was at all grief, but not during the actual battle as part of a um, uh, solidarity pickets and so on. But, uh, you know, I spoke to miners and they got woke up at four in the morning with the police from London had come down and they're banging their shields to wake everyone up. I mean, people obviously were being terrorised. I and mean, it was quite open, open class war. But in terms of if you talk about the political party because of the weakness of the Labour movement becoming the dominant form, well, there's not much sign of a big, of any left political party emerging whilst the Labour movement... Well, fine, but the Labour movement, I mean, the trade unions have been battered, but they represent 7 million people. It's by far the biggest democratic mass movement in the country. It's what the membership's nine times that of all the other political parties put together. Nothing even comes close to that in terms of its base amongst working people. Um, and I think we forget that. I mean, even though it's weak, it's, it's, it's stronger than anything else by, by a factor of, well, a significant number. But you're right, it comes to strategy, obviously. Um, in terms of talking about Mark, the Labour Party turning people into careerists, well, I think if I don't think it's the I think if people are careerists and ambitious, they're careerists and ambitious. I'm not sure necessarily the Labour Party. To, I mean, if people are dedicated enough to, if they're dedicated enough socialists, then you resist that. I think at a time, the problem. I think I think the defeats we've suffered strengthen careerism because for people. It's interesting, again, I mean, this is why I don't like the, this, the, the language of betrayal, for example. I, the problem I have with it, we talk, you know, we talk about whether it be Labour MPs and their betrayals. Partly, I think it's difficult to talk about that because what is there to betray? There's not a mass movement there that exists for them to betray. And the way often you get Labour MPs, trade union bureaucrats, senior Labour activists or whatever, rationalising what they do is this. 
There was no other game in town. I want to fight for my constituents and those I represent as best as possible. Yes, I want to, I don't know, make a name for myself. You've got all those, all those kind of, that pressure dragging them to the right with very little dragging them anywhere else. And I think a lot of people who, fine, end up careerists wouldn't end up careerists, if you like, if there was a strong countervailing pressure against that. But also there was something for them to throw their energies into. I mean, that's not to, you know, just, you know, I know people, obviously, I know lots of people who, who are careerists or, you know, and started off on the left and, well, look, half the Labour front bench started off on the left in some way or other. Would they have drifted off in that direction if the left hadn't been smashed? I doubt it. That's not to let them off. Lots of people stuck to their principles in the face of uh, what happened over the last few decades. But a lot of people fell out of activity. My own parents, for example, would just, you know, they people were burnt out by all the defeats of the 80s and the 90s and, and they were burnt out by it. Others drifted to the right. Um, and I think, again, it's a lot of the consequences of those defeats rather than just the Labour Party killing people's socialism. I think it's the product of defeats and the lack of a strong movement to kind of, that's countervailing pressure to that. Um, Mike, where's Michael? Oh, there you are, sorry. Thank you where you were before. Uh, five minutes. Oh, um, yeah, OK, yeah, fine. In terms of a need for the vision of an alternative society, of course, look, I'm a socialist, I want a socialist society, and that, that, that is what we talk about. But what, what I mean is we have to, and this is what others have talked about, what I mean by start, I said start where people are, it's, it's, it's talk about people's every, everyday experiences, link what we're doing with people's everyday experiences. Talk in the language that people talk in. I mean, I often find going canvassing is helpful just to talk to people, and you often find that often... People's you know, problems in their communities often come across as mundane or whatever, but the left has to respond to, to, to all of them, every issue, from anti-social behaviour uh, and how the left responds to that, uh, to obviously exploitation in the workplace. And the left doesn't have a coherent answer to a lot of those problems. I mean, that's what I'm trying to talk about. Um, uh, yeah, T Tina, in terms of... Um, yeah, again, well, I mean, that you kind of echo what you say, really. Defeat the working class being a source of a lot of this. I think part of it, actually, Thatcher, um, in terms of uh, the individualisation of social problems, that social problems weren't understood as injustices and capitalism, but people's behaviour. Thatcher will be like this. Nowadays, there really is no primary poverty left in this country. In Western countries, we are left with the problems which aren't poverty. All right, there may be poverty because they don't have the budget, don't know how to spend their earnings, but you are left with a really hard fundamental character personality defect. Now that is something Thatcherism hammered away at and is now very, very widespread um, in society um, and, and not just amongst middle class people. Um, and it's something which, which is, yeah, as I say, almost become endemic. I want to talk about the Turkish Kurdish thing, by the way. I mean, I cycled through Dalston. The right to take was on my birthday, actually. It was an interesting birthday, I'm not going to forget. But I think a lot of them, actually, I think that was Turk. I mean, I spoke to people there, actually. I spoke to people surrounding them. And I think it was mostly Turkish restaurant owners and shop owners who, who organised it and basically got their mates and other members of the community to help defend it. Now, whether people, you know, whether that's you know, good or bad, but I, I don't think it was some kind of any sort of working class organisation in any class based way. I think it was uh, local Turkish and Kurdish restaurant owners, in a rational sense, arguably trying to defend their property from what happened. Uh, but I don't know if we can read anything into that on a class basis. Um, Zuri, um, just to go into the riots, just quickly, look. This was no noble uprising, you're right, of the oppressed and downtrodden. And I've read what the SWP written, and it's just not on the same planet that I live on. Uh, now, that's not to condemn uh, what happened any more than, you know, you condemn, um, you know... I mean, I think the rights were a catastrophe in the same way cancer was, is a catastrophe. You don't condemn cancer, you understand why it happened. And for me, there was no, you know, it's not to justify it. I spoke to people in Hackney the next day and people felt terrorised. One of the grievances against the police I heard was that they felt the police drove the rioters into the estates away from the shops and they were terrified. And I spoke to a woman, a young kid clutching her leg. And uh, the left has to understand, has to understand that that, and, you know, I mean, the polls spoke for themselves. 90% of people wanted water cannon used, and it's been used to justify a dramatic shift to the right. It's been used now by Cameron to attack people who are on benefits at the time of mass unemployment. Look, they're not just feckless, they're going out and destroying your property and burning out your homes. 
But again, we have to understand the social causes of it. In the same way, we have to understand the social causes of crime and antisocial behaviour. One in five young people are now out of work. Um, you get people, at, they come out of school at the age of 16 and there's very little for them, particularly in communities like Hackney and Tottenham. And it only takes a very small fraction of people in those communities who have no future to put at risk to act in that way. And that's how I, that's how I largely understood what happened. But that's not, there's no, there was nothing noble about what happened. And it was something which most working class people are, are actually livid about in terms of, and they felt very angry, not just people who got burned out of their homes in Tottenham. And the left has to understand that. Uh, Pat, just to go, I don't know, keep going on about the lump and proletariat thing. I, I don't know, I mean, habitual criminals? I don't know, I mean, in terms of definition, it doesn't matter. Look, I mean, again, the left has to understand antisocial behaviour disproportionately affects working class people. I think we should agree on that. But I think the left has a responsibility to look at the social causes of that rather than just, um, I mean, understanding why that happens, particularly in communities where young working class men in particular don't have a future uh, or feel they don't have a future. Um, just to end, I suppose, Mark. Where's Mark gone? Has he just walked out? He's, uh, Honestly, he's typical hit and run. You didn't offer him any beer. I didn't offer him any beer. I feel just like some alky now. Yeah. What is he's it? Uh, fancy. Yeah, um, yeah, look, again, the vision thing. <laughs> <laughs> Am I getting deep? He's fighting. <laughs> fighting. <laughs> I didn't enjoy that at all. Um, the social basis of the left, I'll talk about because I agree on the vision thing. The, social, the point I make about the left is I don't think necessarily is representative of the working class as it is today. I don't think we have prominent, you know, there's, the left is full of people who work in supermarkets and call centres, which I think is the new expanding working class. And I don't think the left often talks about the conditions facing people um, in the service sector. You know, we'll often actually talk about the public sector in particular, and rightly so. Uh, and public sector workers are not underrepresented in the left. There's no, you know, dispute, there's no disputing that at all. My point was that, for example, particularly in the new working class, I don't think they're represented properly. And that's the expanding section of the working class, which the left has to relate to, the labour movement has to relate to. Um, because what this is about, and what the book is supposed to be about, is about power and representation. What happened was the working class movement was hammered in the 1980s and the demonisation I talk about is the consequence of that. I talk about in the book is it's, it's the demonisation of the conquered by the conqueror in lots of ways. That's not to say that won't be reversed, but at the moment working class power is very, very weak within, um, within British society. And we need to talk, obviously we talk about socialism, and by the way, to talk about working class identity I talk about isn't a cultural thing, let's be proud of being working class. What I mean is actually having working class consciousness again, because I mean, unless you have a working class for itself, then you don't get socialism. You, I mean, obviously we want the dissolution of class society, but to get there you have to have a working class that is conscious of being working class and having working class interests. It's not a cultural thing about being proud of, you know, I don't know, you know, it's not a cultural kind of all working class and proud. It's about actually, well, I mean, that's, yeah, I'm trying to think of some caricature. I mean, that, it isn't, it's about working class, class consciousness. That's what it's about. And that has been battered by what happened in the 1980s. And the left has to accept that. Absolutely smashed in lots of ways. And that makes the left's job very, very difficult indeed. Because that is our, that is the basis of the left. It's a working class that is conscious of its position in society. And that is as far as possible, that is far away as possible, as it has been for a very long time indeed. And that is what we need to address. But the key thing is working class, how we talk about working class power again. Um, and that's the left job, and it's not going to be easy, but that is my book's limited and modest contribution to that debate. Thank you very much.